Hello and welcome to our new SAGE Psychology webinar entitled Why Study Damaged Brains? A Journey into the Fascinating Field of Cognitive Neuropsychology, presented by Dr. Ashok Jansari. My name is Fawzia Eastwood and I'm the Marketing Manager at SAGE Publishing for the Psychology Books Portfolio. I'm a cis woman of South Asian background. I have long brown highlighted hair and brown eyes and I'm wearing a maroon jumper. My pronouns are she, her. Before we start, I'd like to make you aware of some webinar housekeeping. We are recording this webinar. However, we have switched off the cameras and muted the microphones for all participants, except the presenter and host. This is so that everyone will be able to enjoy the session without background noise. The chat box won't be available for participants during this webinar. If you have any questions, you can write them in the question and answer box, and we'll reply to as many of those as we can during the session, and then try to follow up with any that we don't get around to answering today. We would ask that you take advantage of our presenters' expertise and focus any questions around the content of today's webinar. As mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the SAGE Publishing YouTube channel over the next few days. We'll also share it via email and on our Twitter page at SAGE Psychology. We've made closed captions available during this webinar, so to turn them on if they're helpful for you. Sage Publishing has been supporting journeys to knowledge for over 50 years and we're driven by the belief that social and behavioural science has the power to improve society. We are proud to produce high quality resources that support instructors and inspire the future leaders in the field. Our Sage Publishing webinar today is on the theme of cognitive neuropsychology and given by Dr Ashok Jansari, who will be sharing key themes on the topic and sharing specific cases referenced in his recently published book, a student's guide to neuropsychology. You can find out more about his book at our website www.sagepub.co.uk or scan the QR code. Attendees of today's webinar can get 25% discount using the code UKSYCH25 or, you, or if you're a lecturer you can request an electronic inspection copy. Now without further ado I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Dr Ashok Jansari. Dr. Jansari is a cognitive neuropsychologist with over 30 years of experience in the field, having trained at King's College Cambridge, Sussex University and the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. In his research, he studies everyday mental functions such as memory and face recognition by studying individuals who have profound difficulties in these abilities that we take for granted, resulting in a variety of disorders such as amnesia, dementia or prosopagnosia, or the inability to recognise familiar faces. In addition to his research work and expertise, Ashok has also been nominated for a British Academy Charles Darwin Award for communicating science to non-specialist audiences, which recognises his work in disseminating general issues in psychology and science to non-specialist audiences. He has appeared as guest commentator and interviewee on TV in the UK, Germany, Norway, USA, Canada and Japan. In 2011 and 2019, Dr. Jansari won three month residencies at London Science Museum to engage the public in life science. He is the author of A Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuropsychology, published by SAGE this year. And we're delighted to welcome him today. Welcome and over to you, Dr. Jansari. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Fazia. And thank you to all of you for coming along. So I'm Dr. Ashok Jansari and I'm also of East African Indian origin, although I've lived in the UK for most of my life. I'm going to give this talk to give you a flavor for the love affair I've had with this field, cognitive neuropsychology, and which you'll find out more about in the book that I've just published. So to begin with, I'll give you an overview of what this talk is going to entail. First of all, I'll give you a historical introduction to neuropsychology. So what did our ancients, uh, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Indians know or think about the brain? Then I'll go through some neuro myths and neuro facts. This is because there are all sorts of ideas about the brain that pervade popular understanding. Some of those are true and some of those are not true. So I'll go through some of those. Then I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey going through a number of different areas of 
uh, brain damage um, and the disorders that result, particularly uh, object agnosia, of agnosia, amnesia, and dementia. So those are all different types of brain disorders that can occur because of some sort of malfunction or disorder within the brain. And then finally, in a way to try to make things positive, I'm going to talk about how we can improve functioning of the healthy brain using mindfulness meditation. And uh, just as a final thing, if you're a Twitter type of person, then please do tweet about this and you've got my handle there, Ashok. Atashuk Jansari, and if you could hashtag me as the brain guy, I'd be very grateful. Okay, so why do we want to talk about the brain? Most people will never ever see a brain, actually. So why am I interested in it? Well, it's everywhere around us. There's been an age-old debate about whether these mobile phone things are frying our brains with microwaves or not. So we're still trying to work out what's happening to our brains when we put these electronic devices to them. Recently, um, the arts have become interested in the brain and brain disorders. So this is this is a capture from the film Still Alice, which is a film of a true story of a professor of English at Columbia University who started realizing that um, she was losing a grip on her memory. And eventually it became apparent that she had some sort of amnesia, dementia. And so this is a a touching uh, portrayal of how this insidious breakdown of memory can happen to someone who's highly intelligent, successful, etc. More recently, we've had um, an understanding of the fact that contact sports can have a detrimental effect on the brain. So a number of years ago, there was a big lawsuit whereby the um, American Football Players Union sued the NFL, the, the Football League, because a third of the players have been retiring, late 30s, early 40s, and realizing that they've got some forms of dementia. In the UK, we found out that at the 1966 England Football World Cup winning team, five of the players ended up with dementia and four of them died with dementia-related complications. In 2003, England won the Rugby World Cup and one of the players, Steve Thompson, uh, recently has been diagnosed with early onset dementia at the age of 42 and he can't even remember the most important game of his life. And there are more and more cases like this. So we're beginning to realize that repetitive head injuries to, um, through sports, which happens in these contact sports, result in um, what we call micro lesions, so very small amounts of brain damage each time. And each one of those little knocks won't necessarily have an impact on its own, but 20 years of that playing at a high level means that there are many, 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 many small bits of brain damage that eventually add up to um, this awful thing called dementia. So this is something society is going to be having to grapple with soon. Some of you may have heard of a remarkable study uh, conducted in London many years ago where a researcher called Eleanor Maguire discovered that a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which sits above the ear area and a bit further in, about an inch in from the temples area, that area of the brain was bigger in London taxi drivers than in people who didn't drive taxis. And she actually won something called the Ig Nobel Prize, which is a prize for science that first of all makes you laugh and then makes you think. The reason for this is that the hippocampus, that area that she found to be rather large in London taxi drivers, is the area that we use for spatial navigation and moving around society, um, uh, buildings, etc. And when you think about it as hunter gatherers, you know, 100,000 uh, 100, years ago, in the African savannah, we needed to be, be able to locate ourselves spatially to work out where food was, where to avoid danger, et cetera. So this system of spatial navigation was very important. And it seems that the hippocampus was developed for that. And then a hundred thousand years later, we find that London taxi drivers who have to do this 
very difficult test called the knowledge that takes them two years to do, whereby they have to learn the names of streets and uh, buildings and uh, routes all around one of the largest cities in the world, that their hippocampus is bigger than that of people who don't drive taxis. And it demonstrates that uh, the work demonstrated that the hippocampus is like a muscle which grows with practice and that a trainee taxi driver, his or her hippocampus increases in size as they're learning to become a taxi driver. Now, interestingly, a number of years later, about 20 years later, the same team have realized or found out that due to sat navs and Google Maps and all these other uh, things that we use for helping us guide our, our way around society are actually turning off the hippocampus. So the fact that we're not using this beautiful system, the hippocampus for spatial navigation, because we're letting the sat nav or Google Maps tell us what to do, means that the hippocampus is getting to sleep. Most recently, um, the, we've all been through this joint event, uh, the COVID and uh, um, the global lockdown. And although there are physical aspects of COVID that resulted in the breathing problems, etc., some people who survived COVID, the, the um, virus itself initially are left with ongoing problems. So some of my work is to look at people who suffer from long COVID whereby they've got ongoing um, physical and cognitive problems, even though the virus has effectively left them. And this is a paper uh, published by three friends of mine on a, ca a case of brain damage in a woman in India following COVID. Now, this is an extreme example, but we're beginning to see that although we might have thought of COVID as a respiratory illness, which it prim primarily was, it also had other implications. And of course, one of the big implications was the brain. So we see here that although you might never have seen the brain, never studied the brain, in fact, it's central to everything we do. And the point of this webinar is to give you a flavor for that by taking you on the journey through bits of our understanding. So looking at some facts to do with the brain, it weighs less than 2.5% of our total body weight. And yet it accounts for 20% of our energy consumption when we're at rest. So although it's 1 40th of the total body weight, right now, if you're just resting and sitting there and listening to my voice, it's taking up 1 -fifth of your energy consumption, even though it's 40th of your whole body weight. It also burns oxygen and glucose, which are two of the fuels of the body, at 10 times the rate of other body organs, such as the heart and kidneys. So it's doing something that's, that's far superior to its proportion uh, in terms of body weight. There are 86 billion nerve cells within the brain. And um, these nerve cells are basically like long wires that connect with each other and they trans transmit information from one part of the brain to the other. Now, the way that these nerve cells work is that, the, that at the end of each nerve cell, that these um, fingers, um, uh, which are uh, basically their ability to connect with another nerve cell. And when these fingers, like twigs at the end, end of a branch, connect with another twig from another nerve cell, a connection can be made, and that connection results in what we now know is called learning, whereby we, over repeated experience, we learn things. Now, hypothetically speaking, because of the 86 billion nerve cells and the fact that each of these nerve cells could potentially connect to up to a thousand other nerve cells, hypothetically speaking, there are more possible interconnections within the human brain than there are atoms in the observable universe. Now, that doesn't mean that there are that many interconnections, but it just gives you a sense of the potential within the human brain. It doesn't actually reach that number, but it shows us the potential. And effectively, this demonstrates that the brain is the most powerful computer we know. And um, what I'm going to try to do is to give you a sense of that. Now, looking at some neuro myths, so not facts that have come out of some of this understanding, is that there's no such thing as a male and female brain. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't differences between a male brain and a female brain. 
it's not a categorical thing whereby someone can look at a brain and say that's a male brain or a female brain. Everyone has got a brain that's got that's got differences. And so this idea of, of purely male brains and female brains is a complete myth. There's no such thing as left brain and right brain people. There are differences between what the left hemisphere, the left half of the brain and the right hemisphere, the right half uh, do. And um, this is a, a big area that's still up for debate, but there's no such thing as someone being just left brained and only has the skills that the left hemisphere gives us or only is right brained and only has the skills that the right um, hemisphere gives us. Again, these are myths that suggest a binary division within the world between male, female, left, right, et cetera. And these just don't exist. One of the most, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most pervasive myths is that we only use 10% of the brain. And this is complete rubbish. We understand so little about the brain that maybe people have decided that we actually only use a, a bit more than we understand. But I would say that we understand maybe 5% of the brain. We're only, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginnings of our journey of understanding the brain. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to give you an uh, a visual representation of how little we know. So these are some um, neuro myths which, are, which I like to try to dispel. So how have we come to our understanding of the brain? Here's a historical overview. What did our ancestors think about the brain? So I'll tell you a bit about the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Indians, and then the ancient Greeks. This um, uh, uh, visual image is known as the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. And it was found in a market in uh, Cairo. And it is the oldest written documentation of the word brain. And this is because with the ancient Egyptians believing in an afterlife for their pharaohs themselves, etc., what they needed to do was to take the organs out of the body so that they could mummify the body, but also keep the organs in some sort of state that could be used again in the afterlife. So they used to extract all of the organs and keep them in these jars called canopic jars. And this also included the brain. So they needed to extract the brain. And so a scribe, a long time ago, had to come up with some visual representation of this thing that they were taking out from the skull. So this, uh, um, a number of thousand years ago, a uh, scribe wrote, sat down and wrote this. It's the papyrus itself was written around 1700 BC, but it's said to be based on, on Egyptian texts that go back to about 3000 BC. So that implies that 5,000 years ago, an Egyptian scribe sat down and wrote something or created this pictogram or hieroglyphic for, to represent this mushy thing behind our skull. Moving over to ancient India, which is uh, where my ethnic origins are from. In the ancient Indian texts, uh, a physician um, who's known to have treated the Lord Buddha called Chavaka is mentioned. And he's said to have operated on the brain of a merchant and ancient Indian science, medicine, etc., was was quite advanced. And um, so the, uh, in the text, it talks about what this uh, uh, physician had done to someone who was obviously suffering from something that was emanating from the head, from the head, and he had operated on his brain. The Tharva Veda, which is one of the holy Hindu um, scriptures, was composed about 1000 BC, and it speaks of nine areas in the brain which map to different points along the spinal cord, which are called chakras. And these um, chakras are still used in complementary forms of um, medicine and therapy today. So something that was spoken about 3000 years ago in ancient India still has some sort of resonance today. Finally, moving over to Europe, in ancient Greece, Hippocrates, who is um, spoken of as the father of medicine, wrote, that men ought to know that from the human brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and fears. It is the same thing which makes us mad or delirious, inspires us with dread and fear, brings us sleeplessness, inopportune mistakes, 
aimless anxieties, absent-mindedness, and acts that are contrary to habit. Now, the point about this quote is that almost everything that Hippocrates mentioned here is about the human condition, pleasure, joy, laughter, sorrow, pain, sleeplessness, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. The important thing is that the prevailing view at the time was that we are who we are because everything in our soul emanates from the heart. Hippocrates was one of the first people to start talking about our soul and who we are coming from the brain rather than from the heart. And so he moved things for us um, from, away from the heart and towards the brain. Unfortunately, not much happened for about 2,850 years until this man, Paul Broker, hit the scene. And Paul Broker was a doctor in Paris who was seeing a, a patient who had had some sort of brain event, a stroke or something like that. The details don't matter, but the important thing is that Broker noticed that this patient was unable to speak because of this brain event. However, rather than thinking of this patient as having global brain damage and therefore not being able to do anything, Broker realized that in fact, this patient had many intact abilities. So whilst it was pretty obvious that the patient couldn't speak, what Broker realized was what the patient could still do. So if a Broker asked the patient to hold up five fingers, the patient would hold up five fingers, which demonstrated that he could take it language in, understand it, and respond to it. If Broker asked him, what's two plus two? The patient would hold up four fingers, which demonstrates that he understands the question. He can do numerical um, calculation and respond with the four fingers. If Broker asked him to point to a chair, he would point to a chair, demonstrating that he understood the question and that his visual recognition worked so that he could point to the chair that was in the room. The broker said to him, how many fingers did I ask you to point to, uh, um, to um, hold up before? The patient would hold up five fingers, demonstrating that his memory of the question that he'd been asked two minutes before was working. <coughs> Excuse me. So having seen this, broker um, realized that whilst his patient wasn't able to create language, Many of his other cognitive abilities, mental abilities, were intact. His ability to understand language, his ability to count, to add up, his ability to visually recognize, and his memory were all intact. So Broca came up with a hypothesis, which at the time was actually quite revolutionary. He said, I think that our brain has got different areas of speciality. There's one for speaking language, another for understanding language, another for counting, another for visual recognition, and another for memory. And I think that what's happened in my patient is that only the area that is responsible for creating language has been damaged. When the patient died, they autopsied the brain, and um, basically they found that bro at least part of what Broca said was correct. And this is the patient's brain, which has been kept in a medical museum in Paris. And um, the way we're looking at this brain is as if the patient would be looking towards the left. So their eyes would be at the extreme right of the image, sorry, left of the image, and the back of their head would be at the right. Now, basically what Broca saw was that almost the entire brain was completely intact. There's only this one area the area I've highlighted with the um, uh, red uh, oval, where it's gone black, that is the area of brain damage where the brain cells have died and withered away and filled with liquid. And so one of Broca's uh, suggestions came to be true, that the brain was effectively completely normal apart from just one area of brain damage. Now in science, we don't leave things at just one finding. What happened is that a broker talked about this at meetings with other doctors around Europe, and they all started saying, I've had a patient like that. And each time a patient can't speak but can do everything else, what we find is that it's, it's that same area of brain damage. Excuse me. So 
what we got was that this wonderful thing in science, which we call replication. Broker came up with this initial hypothesis and this finding with this patient, and then other um, uh, neurologists found the same thing in their patients. We now know that um, when that area of the brain, which is about where your left temple is, that that area is really important for creating language. And in honor of Broca, we call that Broca's area. And sometimes when older people have a stroke, which affects, uh, which gives them brain damage, what happens is that that area has been damaged and they have difficulties in speaking, and that's known as Broca's aphasia. So basically, in the 1860s or so, Paul Broca made this monumental suggestion that different parts of the brain were specialized for different abilities, and that what had happened with his patient was just the area involved in creating language had been damaged. And this effectively set the scene for what has eventually, it took another hundred years, eventually became what's called cognitive neuropsychology. And by studying these individuals who have had these unfortunate incidents happen to them, who've lost one ability, but whose other abilities are intact, we can get this remarkable window into our own understanding. So why do we explore the human brain? We want to understand the steady state. How is it that your brain is able to take these sound waves that are coming out of your laptop and turn them into some sort of understanding of what I'm saying here at, in my living room in Brighton? How is it that you can take these squiggles of white lines on the screen and get an understanding of this sentence that I've written? So that's understanding the steady state. We want to understand the effects of the environment. What happens when we change someone's environment, either physically, emotionally, etc.? What happens to the brain then? We want to study the impact of brain damage, which is what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Over time, as we've got better and better at our, with our understanding of brain damage, we've begun to slowly able to help people with brain damage. And I'll give you a flavor for that later on in the talk. And then finally, and this is the new movement, as we understand more and more about the brain, we're finding ways to improve brain function in healthy adults, because we can not only help those with brain damage, we can help the average person to improve their functions, and this might be help them improve their cognition, it might help them improve their mental health, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why we explore the human brain in a number of different ways. Okay, so coming to that first question, why study people with brain damage? This is a quote that I use many, many, many times. Craig said, in any well-made machine, one is ignorant of the work of most of the parts. The better they work, the less we're conscious of them. It is only a fault which draws attention to the existence of a mechanism at all. Now, he's talking about the fact that many, many, many things like my mobile phone or my watch, my laptop, are very intricate machines. And I don't know how any of them work. And I don't really need to. It's only when something goes wrong with one of them that I start understanding how complex they are. As an analogy, if you're a car driver, you don't need to know how the car works. You don't need to know the physics, <clears throat> excuse me, the engineering or anything like that about how the car actually functions. You just drive it um, to your convenience. However, if something goes wrong with your car, you'd have to take it to a mechanic who would have a look at it and you would then be asking the person, what's wrong with my car um, while they fix it? And the mechanic might say, it's the gearbox. And you say, I've never heard of a gearbox. What's a gearbox? And they describe this thing called the gearbox, which allows your car to do certain things. Then a couple of months later, your car's not working again. You take it back to the mechanic and the mechanic, and you, by speaking to the mechanic, you find out, this time it's not the gearbox, but this time it's something called the fan belt. You don't know what a fan belt is, so you ask them what it is and they explain it to you. A couple of months later on you know, in this rather dodgy car that you've got, 
um, it stops working and you say, is it the fan belt or the gearbox? And the mechanic says, no, it's the cooling system. And you say, what's a cooling system? And over time, <clears throat> you start understanding what the fan belt is, what the gearbox is, the cooling system, the engineer, the electrics, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, if you're unlucky enough, you would be able to understand how your whole car works, but never by having looked at your car while it was working, because you were just driving it without any knowledge of how it works. You would have come to your understanding by studying it and looking at it when it had broken down. And each of the parts breaking down gives you an idea of how they work. And that allows us to understand how the whole machine works. So going back to Broker and his patient, he saw a patient who had one system not working, which was the language system. But the other systems were working fine. So he was able to study those, but also study what, was gone, what had gone wrong with the language system. And that helped us move forward in terms of our understanding of the language system, et cetera. And what I'm going to do now is going to take you on a journey with different types of patients and show you how we do that by studying these people who've lost a particular ability. So a basic necessity for survival is nourishment, finding food and avoiding danger, uh, becoming another animal's food on the savanna. Visual recognition is vital for this. We need to be able to see that lion or leopard or whatever, and we need to be able to avoid them. And we also need to be able to visually recognize the nice berries we want to eat or the fruit we want to eat, etc. Now we know that this particular system exists, a specific system for visually recognizing things in the outside world, because it can be selectively impaired. And by selective impairment, I mean that it can be damaged whilst leaving all of the other systems intact. So just like in Broca's case, it was the creating language system that had been selectively impaired. In visual agnosia, the system that does visual recognition has been selectively impaired, but the other systems are still intact. Now, a famous example of this is uh, the book by Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, which is a popular science book, uh, true stories of patients that Oliver Sacks, a British neurologist, had, had seen in his um, consulting rooms. And he described patients who'd lost certain abilities. And the man who mistook his wife for a hat was a patient with visual agnosia. I'm going to show you a video of a patient, Philip, who unfortunately had suffered a road traffic accident. And as a result of that, Philip has been left with profound visual agnosia. Now in Philip's case, the damage to his brain is in the back of the brain, so behind the ears. So in, um, in this image, um, the, the front of the brain and the front of the head and the eyes would be on the, again on the left-hand side, and the back of the head is on the right-hand side. So Philip's brain damage is in that area at the back behind the ears. So in this video, Philip is taken to a zoo and he's just asked to describe what he sees. So it's important when we look at a patient like this to notice not only what they can't do, but what they can do. One of the first things we learn to do is to recognize and name animals. Camel. Camel? They're camels. I'll hazard against the camels. <laughs> Too late, giraffe. But if I hadn't seen the cyphers, then I wouldn't have known. So what we see there with Philip is that his vision is working enough such that he can see there's an animal there and he's noticing certain things about the animal, etc. But he's not able to recognize this as a giraffe and he thinks it's a camel. And it's not only the, the real object he can't recognize. So if you showed him a model of a giraffe, he'd still have difficulty recognizing it. But with other visual things, uh, Philip is generally okay. It tends just to be living things that he has a problem recognizing. And because we have many patients who can't recognize living things, but they can recognize tables, chairs, helicopters, et cetera, we think that, that this is because the human brain has developed 
a system for recognizing living things because we needed those for survival, things we eat, animals that we're running away from, etc. That system has developed, but then as we started creating objects, a different type of recognition system came about. Now, as we evolved, we eventually formed social structures where we started living with the, um, other members of our tribe, etc. And in these structures, we need to be able to at least facially recognize other members of our tribe. Now, it's facial recognition that's important because we can recognize people in other ways, but the facial recognition is the most useful one, especially at a distance. Now, we know that this system again exists as a as a specialist system, because there's a selective impairment known as prosopagnosia. Um, the term face blindness is used, but I don't particularly like it because it suggests that the patients cannot see the face, but they can actually see the face. They just can't understand the face. Now I'm going to show you a, a, a patient that I studied for a number of years called David. David had suffered a massive brain hemorrhage, which had resulted in a very deep coma to the point where they were thinking of turning the life support machine off. Um, they didn't, and thankfully he survived, Kate pulled through, and um, he was left with uh, this brain damage, which is again at the back of his head behind the ears. This image is as if you're looking down on David from above and his eyes are at the top and the back of his head is at the bottom of the image. And he's ended up with this damage on the right hand side of his brain at the back in the, in the occipital areas. David had a number of problems when he first came out of the coma, but that's because of the swelling in his brain. But one particular profound problem is one that's never gone away. All of the other problems have gone away. But the one profound problem that hasn't gone away was that he couldn't recognize the little people running around his bed or the woman in the chair next to the bed crying. The woman was his wife and the little people were his grandchildren. And David is still left with a profound inability to recognize familiar faces. So in this video, I'm going to show you um, uh, a, test, a test that I was doing with David, where I was showing him famous faces, and I was asking him whether he recognized the person, and uh, if he did, what their name was, and on a scale of one to ten, how certain he was who this person was. This video was taken about 17 or 18 years ago during one of the Iraq wars, and this Tony Blair was our prime minister at the time. So let's see whether David recognizes this face and then what happens next. No. Okay. Is that Marilyn Monroe? One to 10? I would say seven. Okay. Because there's a little beauty spot and the red lips don't show red, but you can sort of yeah, right. can't imagine saying happy birthday, Mr. President. Okay. Okay, so what we see there is that, first of all, David didn't recognize our prime minister at a time of war when the prime minister was on TV all the time. The next, this picture, which before Kim Kardashian and all her selfies on the internet, that photograph of Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol was one of the most famous photographs ever taken. And if you recognized it, you'd recognize it in about half a second. In David's case, he didn't actually recognize the face. He didn't say that was Marilyn Monroe. He actually asked whether it was Marilyn Monroe. And he said that on a scale of one to 10, he was seven out of 10 certain that it was her. And he said it was because of the beauty spot, the curly hair, the lips, etc. So we see that although he kind of gets the right answer, he, he doesn't even actually know that it's her, he's guessing at some level. Now, in a, uh, a talk that I was giving, a public talk, David happened to be in the audience. And during that time, this was the American president. And I found it difficult to say this man's name because of what we felt he might be doing around the world. And so I said, David didn't even recognize this person. 
David happened to be in the audience and he nudged my student, Scott, who'd been working with, uh, working with David for his research dissertation. And he said, Scott, I didn't even recognize myself. And Scott said, that's not you, that's George Bush. So David saw that I'd shown a picture of a man around his age with a similar structure to his face. Uh, David also has a rectangular face. And he decided that it must be himself because I said, look, David didn't even recognize himself. So we see that a patient can, won't even recognize themselves. And he put two and two together and in this case got this banana thinking, oh, that must be my face, even though it's of George Bush. And with a study that we were doing, we wanted to look at this kind of thing. And it, formally we wanted to test how good or bad his face recognition was. So we got 20 pictures of people that David would have recognized if he hadn't got brain damage and 20 of people who were uh, strangers who he should have said no to. So this is our classic research design where we give half the faces would, we would expect him to say yes to and half we'd say no to. And the 20 faces that he should have recognized if he didn't have brain damage were famous people, but I also got some pictures of his wife, his children, uh, grandchildren, the neuropsychologist who referred him to me for um, testing. And we also used a picture of myself because we weren't sure whether David recognized me or not, because there was an incident where I wasn't sure um, about his recognition. And we made sure that I wasn't there on the day of testing. And we used this picture uh, of me, which is from about 18 or 19 years ago. And David um, came to this picture and Scott asked him whether he recognized the face or not. And David said, yes, he did. So Scott then asked him, who is it? And David said, it's George Michael. And Scott was um, very professional and didn't laugh his head off. And he said, on a scale of one to 10, how certain are you that that's George Michael? And David said 10. Now, those of you who don't know who George Michael was, he was um, part of the boy band um, Wham! And then he ended up with a, a very big solo career. So these are pictures of George Michael. Now, I'm not saying this because I think I look like George Michael, but it's about why he might have thought I was George Michael. We've written a paper that is open access, so anyone can Google this and get a copy of this paper called The Man Who Mistook His Neurocycle for a Pop Star. Because by looking at David and the errors he makes, like thinking that I was um, George Michael, what we see is that he's not making a random guess. He didn't think I was Marilyn Monroe or George Bush. What was it that made him think that I was George Michael? Well, there was a gold earring that I wore for about 20 years before I lost it. There's my goatee beard, which I used to fashion for a long time until I just couldn't be bothered because it's a lot of hard work. There's my skin color. I am Indian and George Michael was Greek. So we've both got slightly darker skin. And David's intellect works. His memory, etc., his sense of humor, uh, all of that works. And he knows that these psychologists are constantly showing him pictures of famous people. And so he thinks to himself, who do I know who's famous, who's got a gold earring, a dark skin tone and a goatee beard? And he comes up with George Michael. Now, what we see here is that David isn't blind. He can see my face. The thing is that he doesn't see my face the way you would. So if you were to see me, meet me, you wouldn't look at different aspects of my face, the left eye, the right eye, my goatee or whatever facial hair I have. You'd see the whole you'd see what we call a gestalt, and you see the whole face together. And we believe that this is because for evolutionary purposes, seeing the face very quickly as one object was vital for survival. And so the brain developed a system that's different to the one that it uses for recognizing giraffes and carrots and things like that. It created one system, which is just for human faces, to look at this interesting configuration of two eyes, a nose and a mouth, which are actually just a very small limited number of features. And yet it gives us the huge variety of faces that we see in humanity. And what happens with someone like David is that when that system is damaged, he has to revert to a different system, which is a jigsaw piecemeal, which adds up the visual scene and works out that that might be a camel.
it's not a camel, but the, the thing between a camel and a giraffe is a long neck. So he's using visual cues within the scene to try to work out what he's seeing. And in this case, he thought that I was George Michael because <clears throat> of these visual features. So um, prosopagnosia from brain damage that David had is extremely rare. So it's called acquired prosopagnosia because the patient used to be able to recognize faces, but now has lost that ability. In fact, there are only 12 papers published in the world of pure cases of acquired prosopagnosia because it's so rare. However, some people have had it from childhood without any known brain damage, and that's known as developmental prosopagnosia. So these people have always had weaknesses in face recognition. And in fact, I gave a lecture the other day and I looked out and there were about 100 students there. And I said, statistically, there are probably two of you who can't recognize faces. And guess what? At the end of the lecture, two people came up to me and told me that they thought they had prosopagnosia. Estimates suggest about 2.52% of children have it. So about one in 40, one in 50 people have it. There are famous people like Brad Pitt, um, Duncan Ballantyne, who's on the UK's version of Dragon's Den, and the primatologist uh, Jane Goodall. All of these people, and even Oliver Sacks, um, had profound or have profound difficulties in recognizing human faces. But they have no brain damage, and that's why it's called developmental prosopagnosia. They've always had this profound difficulty. And it varies. So there are big differences between prosopagnosic. So they, it's not just one condition, it's a number of conditions. There is another end of the spectrum known as super recognition. And these are people who've got remarkable facial rec recognition, often many years after meeting someone very, very briefly. Now, this is important because it tells us that there are people who, who've got a very good face recognition system, unlike those people who've got the development of prosopagnosia. And in fact, the uh, Metropolitan Police in, in the UK, in London, they now use a team of um, the, uh, um, police officers who've been identified as super recognizers to find criminals in situations where uh, the known criminals uh, are um, expected to be, and they can pick them out for crowd really easily. So myself and some colleagues, we've been looking at this ability and we've published a number of papers looking at the superior face recognition in um, these super cops as it were. Finally, I want to turn to memory. To increase the chance of survival, the knowledge and learning from our previous, previous experiences is extremely beneficial so that you don't have to learn how to do something all over again. If you can touch type, you don't want to have to touch type all over again. If you can store that information and that skill, the next time you can do something more quickly. So what did my friend say to me 10 minutes ago so that you don't, your friend doesn't think that you're not listening? Have I met this person before? Were they good to me or were they someone that I've got to be careful of? How did I build that weapon that allowed me to defend myself? Uh, so this is about how we do things. Where was that source of food that I found last week? And again, this um, reminds us of when we were hunter-gatherers and, and our spatial memory is important. Now, all of these types of knowledge require a system that encodes, which means takes in and stores those previous experiences so that later on, when you need to remember what your friend said or work out whether you've met this person before, et cetera, you're able to call on those previous experiences. Now, we know that this system of storing this information and using it again exists because of the selective impairment known as amnesia. I'm going to show you a video of me working with one of my patients, Nicola, who suffered um, brain damage through a nasty virus called herpes simplex encephalitis. And this image is as if we're looking through Nicola's face um, so that uh, on the sides we'd have a left and right ears and the area of darkness that I've pointed out there is the area of damage um, that uh, the dark area should be light gray like we see further up in the brain and in this video I give Nicola a bunch of words to remember and I ask her to recall them Im immediately and see how many words you remember yourself then after a conversation that lasted just about a minute, 
see how many words you can remember and see how many she can remember and then see what happens next. Have you been on holiday recently? I think so. We haven't, have we? Oh, we have. Oh, I beg pardon. I don't remember. Okay. okay. Nicola, I'm, I'm just going to try a little, just a small memory test with you. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to read out um, eight words to you. And what I'd like you to do is to just, as, when I finish, repeat, the repeat words, to, or, 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 whatever you can. Okay, so, are you ready? Okay. Table. Lion, apple, shoe, carpet, robin, carrot, flower. Table, apple, lion, shoe, flower, um, can't remember anymore. You did pretty well there, you got five out of eight, so. I got about four. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did better than Reg there, so yeah. well done. Okay, how are you at, at recognising people on TV? Do you watch much TV or films? I watch television, don't I? In films. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you recognise the people on the film? I don't know, do I? Sometimes. Sometimes. What's, what's your favourite programme? EastEnders, I suppose. <laughs> I have it on. So what's happening in EastEnders at the moment? Um, well, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I'd have to wait for it to start and then it... It comes back. It, I think, oh, so and so, so and so. Okay, I'm just going to go back to those words that I gave you. Can you tell me it, what words I gave you? No, I can't. Can you even remember one of them? No, none of them. Okay, now I'm just going to see how how, how well the couch over there does. <laughs> okay. Uh, Apple, right. lion, robin. Uh, robin, table. I've got four this week. That's four again, yeah. That's fun, yeah. That was between two of you, that. Yeah, two, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've got two, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't yeah. mind, I'm just going to go to the bathroom. It's right. just near just the door, isn't it? Front door, yeah. Okay, um, if you guys just want to talk about your, uh, what you did in Spain. What we did in Spain. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tell Nicola about what you guys got up yeah. in Spain. You remember going to Spain? You only got back on um, No, I don't remember Thursday, going. Tuesday night. Tuesday. Tuesday. Hello everybody. Hello. Hi, Ash. Hello. Have we met before? I don't think so. No, my name's Ash. So what we see there is possibly the most profound case of amnesia you will ever see. Um, Nicola's memory, as you saw, her ability to hold on to a couple of words that I gave her immediately was quite good. She remembered five out of eight words. Um, her husband and sister, who didn't know they were going to be tested, remembered four. So her ability to take information in was okay. But literally 45 seconds later, when I asked her for the words, she'd forgotten them all, whilst her husband still remembered about four. And that shows us that memory is made up of at least two different things. A short-term memory, which is in the last couple of weeks, that's a, a popular uh, my, uh, uh, myth that memory is the uh, short-term memory is the last couple of weeks. It's literally only what you can hold in consciousness. So about a minute, a minute and a half at most. That it was okay with Nicola, but she had problems in her long-term memory. We know by studying people like Nicola that, so short-term memory would be me giving you my phone number, for example. We know that by study, if, studying people like Nicola, that long-term memory breaks up into two different sections. Procedural memory, which is skill-based information, such as how to play a guitar, how to make a lasagna, or how to touch type, and declarative memory, which is memory for um, factual information. And declarative memory itself breaks down into two different types of memory, such as episodic memory, which is memory for events, such as my 50th birthday party, and um, factual information that's got nothing to do with me, such as Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. So by studying people like Nicola in great depth, we see that this thing called memory is quite big. It's not just one thing, it's many different things. And we see that it's not all of her memory that's been impaired because her short-term memory is actually intact. The ability to take in information and hold it for a minute is intact. But we also know that procedural memory, which is memory for skills, is also intact. Now, why is that important? The reason that this is important is that we now know 
that not all of memory has been destroyed in patients with amnesia. And we can try to use these intact abilities to develop some forms of rehabilitation. So in this video, and this is very preliminary research, what we did is that uh, we taught Nicola how to use a palm top. And a palm top was an electronic organizer, which is the precursor to mobile phone. So it was basically like a mobile phone, but couldn't make calls. And at the time, people were using them to, as reminder systems, etc. Now, you saw that Nicola couldn't hold anything in her memory for more than a minute. So in this video, my student Gail is showing Nicola this palm top and she asks her whether she's ever seen it before. So have you used this machine before? I can't remember. Don't recognise it? I'll switch it on. If we just wait a second before we... Um... I switched it on, yes. Yeah. So you don't recognise the machine at all, no? Oh, no, not really. No. Okay, so it looks like Nicola doesn't know how to use this. Now what I'd like to do, and this happened, this video is literally straight after that. Gail had programmed the palm top to give a little um, reminder of something. And let's see what happens with Nicola. Now what I'd like to do is to look at her face and her hand and see what happens. Make a cup of tea. Do you want me to make a cup of tea? I oh, would love a cup of tea if you don't mind. Do you fancy one? Oh, I'd love a cup of tea. So what we see there is that Nicola had claimed that she'd never seen this thing, didn't know how to use it, etc. And that may have been true. But in fact, that wasn't true. It's just that she couldn't remember it. But we'd used a very laborious process which relied on that intact short-term memory and the intact procedural memory to very painstakingly teach her how to use this palm top. It's taken us a month to do that with repeated exercises, which where she couldn't remember doing them, but we knew she was learning them. So you saw that Nicola claimed never to have seen a palm top before and not know how to use one. And yet when the thing rang, she didn't even look at it. Her hand reached out, picked it up, opened it, and she knew what to do. And this is the power of studying people with these conditions to try to understand the things that you and I can do, but which may have broken down in some patients. But we see the things that Nicola was able to do, and we can use that to try to develop rehabilitation. Now, this is very early days in this type of research, but it demonstrates that we get a lot of value by studying people with these conditions. Now, another type of memory problem, which is completely different is dementia. And dementia is a degenerative disorder. There are many different types of dementia. Um, Alzheimer's is the one that people have heard of most, but there's frontotemporal dementia, um, there's uh, uh, Lewy body dementia, uh, semantic dementia. So these are different types of, of brain disorders, but the main common theme is that they're degenerative with different parts of the brain beginning to slowly break down and over time, different types of cognitive systems get broken down and one of the main cognitive systems that is broken down is memory and this is why we think of dementia as a memory problem it's not actually just a memory problem but these are um, estimates of the number of people living with dementia around the world at different points in time and if we just look around the world in 2015 there were about 46 million in 2030 about 75 million and it's projected in 2050 to be about 130 million. Now, this isn't because this is a, an infectious disease. It's simply because, because of better health care, people are living longer lives, which is great because we're, we're lifting parts of um, sub-Saharan Africa, South America, Southern Asia out of uh, um, points where people are dying at younger ages and they're living longer lives. But then because they're living longer lives, we're able to see this dementia coming out. Now, the cost of dementia care um, estimated annually in 2015 was $818 billion. By 2018, this had already um, gone up to $1 trillion a year. 
And by 2030, it's predicted to go up to 2 trillion. So it costs a lot of money. There's the care of the individuals. There's um, uh, time lost by uh, family members who are trying to care for their loved ones. There's the um, people giving up work to look after their loved ones, etc. So there's a massive toll on society, financially, emotionally, on the families, etc. Now, unfortunately, the burden is going to be biggest for um, the developing world. So in the high income countries where birth rates are um, slowing down, we're not seeing that much of a change over the next, say, 30 years. But in the low and middle income countries, which are benefiting from better health care and therefore their populations living to 65, 70, et cetera, that's where the dementias are coming out. And unfortunately, those are the countries that can't afford dementia care. So what we need to do is to try to find a way to help here. At the moment, we can't um, stop dementia. There's no cure for it. What we can do, however, is to try to detect it more um, quicker, because then if we can detect dementia more quickly, we might actually be able to provide systems of support, not the same as with Nicola, but different things that we are developing with people with dementia, sometimes using assistive technologies such as phones, et cetera, and we can at least prepare people for when things get worse. So earlier diagnosis become one of the golden goals at the moment. At the moment, the diagnosis tends to happen when the disease process progressed quite a bit. So this is an area that myself and my PhD student have been working on for quite a bit. And we've developed a test that we call ValMT. And we've published a number of papers on this, and I'm happy to share the details um, if anyone wants. But generally speaking, the way that this test works is that we teach people information, and then we test them five minutes, 30 minutes, and 55 minutes later. And in this study that we published, we tested some people in their 20s, the young group, and what we see is very little forgetting over the space for an hour. Then we tested um, a group of elderly people in their 60s. So we've got a young group and an elderly group. Now, initially, our results demonstrated that the elderly group performed worse than the younger group, but that's not rocket science. We'd expect a younger group to, uh, an older group to perform worse. But what we noticed was something that we weren't expecting. Within our elderly sample, there were two subgroups. There's one group who tended to learn our task very quickly, and they didn't forget very much at all. So in fact, when we looked at their memory profiles, they looked like 20 year olds. But there's another group who learned the same amount, but they just took longer to learn it. And these people forgot much more quickly. And by 55 minutes, they were statistically different compared to um, the other 60 year olds who performed quite well. And this difference we've seen seems to also match their subjective complaints of memory. And we know that people who begin to subjectively complain of memory problems are at greater risk of uh, developing dementia in the next three to five years. And importantly, on a standard clinical test that clinicians use today for trying to detect memory problems, these elderly A and elderly B participants would look indistinguishable. So the important point here is that on our test, we're able to pick up people that we think are at risk of developing dementia in the next three to five years in a way that current clinical tests cannot. So there may be a possibility that our test is picking up a preclinical signature of dementia. So this is leading to a lot of exciting work that we're doing with a number of groups around the world at the moment. So if we put together some of the things we've learned, we start getting a roadmap of what the brain does. And this is actually uh, my brain, three-dimensional pictures of my brain that were developed by um, Hannah Damasio, who's one of the top brain images in the world from when I worked with her and her husband, Antonio Damasio, in the States. Uh, and it shows the different areas of the brain and how by studying people like Broca's patient, Philip, David, Nicola, et cetera, we get a sense of what different areas of the brain do. Now, this was done in 1999. So, this is 23 years old. So this is almost a form of cave art because we've learned so much since then. Okay, the final thing I wanna tell you about is how to improve 
um, healthy brain functioning. And this is a quote from one of my most favorite people in the world, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And it's a book called The Art of Happiness. And in this book, His Holiness says, the systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Now, the important point here is that we've got a theologian who's talking about this thing called happiness, which often is, is seen as the realm of theology and philosophy. But in fact, he's saying, actually, it's the brain that's, that's doing it and that we can do something about it. So the Dalai Lama has a retinue of monks that talks to Western neuroscientists, and researchers, and they do a lot of work. So th this is a picture here on the left of His Holiness taking a photograph of someone going into a brain scanner um, to look at their brain while they've been, after they've been doing mindfulness meditation. Now, mindfulness meditation is a secular form of meditation that was developed out of Zen Buddhism to try to get the goodness out of meditation, but without the religion, et cetera, et cetera. And this thing called an eight-week um, course has been developed called Mindfulness Meditation, the eight-week course, and they've had profound impacts on people's lives. What they found is that when people do this eight-week course, it helps reduce a relapse after heart surgery. It's now recommended in the UK as um, a part of the treatment for people with recurrent depression, and it's called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, so MBCT. It's also been used to help people who suffer from chronic pain and psoriasis. It also impacts the immune system. So in one beautiful study, two groups of people um, were, did something for eight weeks. One group did the mindfulness meditation. The other group didn't do the meditation, did something else. At the end of it, both groups were given um, a flu vaccine, and then they looked at the response of their blood systems to this vaccine in terms of level of antibodies. What they found is that the group that did the mindfulness meditation had a much stronger immune response. So there's something about the stress response that's reduced or improved rather by mindfulness meditation. Finally, a beautiful study has demonstrated that there are physical impacts in the brain. In the study, um, Americans who were long-term meditators, the ones in, in um, the uh, blue circles in this graph, were tested, and parts of their brain that are important for our ability to um, attend to the world, to feel, et cetera, were tested, and they were compared against controls who didn't meditate. So basically, they compared them with people who were on every other measure were the same. Well, the controls, the ones in the red squares, what we see is a thinning of the brain that happens. And that we've known for years that the brain is slowly degenerating and, and that's part of aging. But what we see with the meditators is that there's a flat line. Their brains are not deteriorating. And so what it seems is that meditation is helping keep the brain from deteriorating. So one of my take home messages is go and start doing me mindfulness meditation. Okay, um, the, just as a quick thing, if anyone is interested in any of the studies that I'm doing, we're doing studies on face recognition, memory and amnesia, and demen dementia, and also something called executive functions. If you're interested in this at all, then either email me or email uh, my team, which is art.girl.mind at gmail.com. So finally, I'm going to wrap up and try to explain to you why we know so little. So I'm going to tell you about the life of Brian. This is a timeline of um, uh, 3,000 years. Edwin Smith Papyrus written about 1,000 BC, Christ born after that, the Norman conquest of Great Britain, and then finally, my momentous occasion, which is about two weeks ago, finally having a picture of myself um, with my book in a bookstore. So that's a 3,000 year period. Now, many people don't like big numbers. So I'm going to divide that by 100 and imagine that it's a 30 year time scale. So I'm going to change the numbers a bit. So I'm going to imagine that this 3,000 year period is in fact 30 years. And that it's a 30 year old man called Brian. And I'm going to take you on a journey from when Brian was born 30 years ago to today. 
But to contrast, I'm going to show you what's happened in his older brother, science's life. So what's been happening in science while we've been trying to understand the brain? What we found is that when Brian was five, Pythagoras uh, created the, um, uh, his theorem about right angle triangles, which has been extremely important for helping us understand how walls stand up, et cetera, et cetera, how to build bridges. When Brian was 11, Ptolemy charted the universe and was able to tell us where many of the, the planets were relative to one another. When Brian was 22, Cambridge University was founded. When Brian was 25, Copernicus did a revolutionary thing and took the earth away from the center of the universe and um, put the sun in its place. He got into a lot of trouble with the Catholic church, but we know that Copernicus was correct. When Brian was 26, Harvey charted the blood system in the body, which is the, for, uh, the foundation of modern medicine. When Brian was 27, an apple fell on Newton's head somewhere in Cambridge, and we discovered gravity. When Brian was 28 and a half, Darwin in Cambridge uh, uh, published The Origin of Species, which tells us where we've come from. And when he, Brian was 29, um, the, uh, Einstein wrote his famous theory of relativity. And when he, uh, Brian was 29 years and five months, Watson and Crick decoded DNA, which is the other building blocks of survival. And finally, five months ago in Brian's life, we set foot on another terrestrial um, world. What's been happening in the life of Brian while all this has been happening in, in his older brother science's life? Well, we know that Brian was born 30 years ago. Well, nothing that we know today about the brain was found out before Broca's monumental work on his patient uh, when Brian was 28 and a half. So we've only started that journey. Psychology as a field was born after Broca's discovery. And cognitive neuropsychology, which the field I work in and what the content of my book, book is, was actually only born four months ago when a group of largely British neuropsychologists got together and started looking at how we can use people with brain damage as a mirror onto our own abilities. Finally, this is a, a photograph of Uluru or Ayers Rock in Australia, at the Red Mountain, and it looks like a skull and a brain. And this is where the first ever neuropsychological rehabilitation conference happened. And in Brian's 30 year life, this happened just two weeks ago. So only two weeks ago, were we able to come together to see if we could try to develop rehabilitation like the one that to, um, we're doing for patients like Nicola. Now I know because I was there at that first ever meeting and it's one of my favorite meetings that I go to. But the point of this analogy was to help you see that this rehabilitation, even the understanding of the brain is very new. Basically, we are like a baby crawling in the dark and that's why we don't only use 10% of the brain. We understand probably less than 5% of the brain. But that means that this journey into cognitive neuropsychology that I've been on for 30 years is a really exciting one and one that I want to share with my students and anyone who listens to me. Um, if you want to know more about my work um, during lockdown, I gave a number of free talks online. And from that, I developed a YouTube uh, channel and you can find that here at Dr. Ashraf Jansari Neurotalk. And I'd, um, I'd request that if you went to the, the channel that you subscribe to it, it's free. It's just that we're trying to get up to a thousand subscribers to help us with functionality. Thank you very much. Um, hello, and um, thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, Dr. Jansari. That was a very illuminating and very interesting presentation. And um, yes, totally enjoyed it myself. Um, I hope everybody you. enjoyed that also. And um, if there were any questions, we would be um, actually happy to take a few now. So I'm just going to check really quickly. Um, my screen doesn't need to move. Here. But let me just see if there's any questions in the meantime. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, 
Okay, ah, right, the question came in, uh, and it's why do we have difficulty remembering people's names who we've just met? That's, that's, that's a lovely question, and it's one that I get all of the time. The reason for that is because the name is actually an arbitrary, um, uh, an arbitrary label. It's got nothing to do with the space. Just like if you look at this as a, a glass, that's the English word glass. Now, I'm learning Spanish at the moment, and it's not glass in Spanish, it's vaso. And it's a completely different word for the same thing. So that word that we either say or write is just an arbitrary label for this thing. So similarly, there's nothing in this that is Ashok. I'm called Ashok because that's the name I was given, but there's nothing here that tells you it's Ashok. But your, the, the brain was developed to allow you to recognize this visual thing. And then at some point we start giving ourselves names to remember to you know, talk to one another, et cetera. So that's why the name tends to be the, the difficult thing because the name is just actually this, this uh, artificial label that we've attached to this visual stimulus. And we all forget names at some point or other. I'm, I'm kind of like a super recognizer and I remember people very, 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 very well. But even I, if I'm tired or stressed, I can do a, a, a oh, Fosia. So I might, it might take me like a second to, to work out your name, remember it, just because I'm tired. In fact, at my book launch party a couple of weeks ago, I was introducing my mother to one of my friends and I'd forgotten her name because I was stressed. I was trying to sort out this party. So that's why we have that difficulty. But interestingly, this also helps us see why people with dementia, the first thing that tends to go in person recognition with dementia is the name. So they can't remember their child or their partner's name, but they know that it's their child or their partner. It's just that the name has gone first and then we eventually start getting more complex forms of um, the dementia coming through. I hope that helped. Thank you, that's, that's fantastic. And um, definitely I have that problem sometimes myself. It's a very, very common one. Um, hope I don't have to worry. Um, another question has come through, um, and this one is um, from Ali, and they're saying, is developmental proper um, prosopagnosia, <laughs> sorry, um, prosopagnosia all or nothing? Can you be a little more, can you be a little prosopagnostic, or so recognize or distinguish people that you see frequently, but not so others you don't see frequently? That's a lovely question, Ali, and it's, it's a very important one. Because, um, uh, by the way, it's prosopagnosic rather than agnostic. Um, the, um, the, re the, the answer is that, yes, there are grades of prosopagnosia. Just like um, I can run, but I'm never going to win a gold medal in a running race. When we see, when we see the um, Olympics, we see the fastest person, the second fastest person, the third fastest person, and they each get a different type of medal. So even though these people are super runners, there are differences between them. And you have that difference at the international level, the national level, the club level, et cetera. So in that same way, um, with prosopagnosia, which is at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, differences. Now, there are statistical ways how we can diagnose someone as uh, prosopagnosic. It's not easy, but we tend to use a number of tests and, and we run a number of tests ourselves. But you can have someone who's pretty bad, but who's not fully prosopagnosic. And then you have some people who are really off the scale. Um, so yes, there are differences. And um, what you said about um, when you don't see people that frequently, that would contribute as well because of the fact that um, if you see someone a lot, you, you're going to have their name because that's Mary that you see, you know, three times a day, but someone else you might not see that easily. So, um, yes, there are differences between different levels of prosopagnosia. Thank you. Um, so um, a couple of other questions. I'll try and take a couple more here. Uh, yeah. so we've got a little bit of time. Um, so. Um, Susanna has asked, do neurons regenerate in other areas of the brain besides the hippocampus? 
Um, it's a good question, Susanna. I'm not an expert on the biological aspects, but but yes, neurons do regenerate, but we don't really know that much about it, and certainly I don't. So that is one of the things that is like the holy grail. What happens in areas of the brain where things are getting damaged, where um, there is degeneration going on, is it possible to regenerate? Now, some areas it might be more possible than others, but we don't really know. We know that the brain is a bit plastic and that um, changes can happen, but we're still trying to mark that out. That work is separate from the work that I do because I'm working at the cognitive end. So I'm not in touch with that physical, biological end of things, but I know that people are doing that and there will be differences in different parts. So just like, you know, if heart muscle gets damaged, it's probably quite difficult for that to repair. Whereas if, you, if a muscle in your arm gets damaged, it's probably easier for that to regenerate. So it's probably the same with the brain as well, that there will be differences across the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to mention that if um, anybody is interested in the biological psychology aspect, we do have a lot of um, textbooks at Sage Publishing around that too. So do check out our website on those. Um, so another question came in as well. Um, oh, so this one, um, is it possible that a person with an acquired brain injury, such as gunshot wounds of the temporal frontal cortex, is it possible for them to recover? Um, uh, good question. Unfortunately, it depends on how you re refer to recovery. Uh, I did work with a lady in the States who unfortunately had tried to take her own life and had tried to use a gun to take her own life. And unfortunately, she she'd failed in terms of she didn't take her own life, but she was left with major brain damage. Um, once that damage has happened at the moment, but kind of linked to the previous uh, question, at the moment, we don't really know what regeneration of the brain and things like that is and what is possible. At the moment, there's no, there's no large scale uh, recovery of that brain area. What we're trying to do in rehabilitation is to see what abilities are intact and can we use those. So this is why I highlighted um, Nicola's ability to learn how to use that um, palm top, even though she can't remember to do it. Now her brain damage, we, we couldn't change anything about that, but we were able to use the fact that her procedural memory, that skill learning was still intact and we went around the problem because we knew that she wouldn't remember that she'd used it, but we just wanted her to physically be able to use it as a skill. So that's what we're trying to do in terms of recovery, but it's not really recovery. It, we call it compensation. That we're compensating for the problem that the patient is experiencing by working around it. And in fact, the last chapter of the book is about this um, exciting area of cognitive rehabilitation. How can we help people with, with permanent brain damage still do some of the things that they need to? And it's a slow, laborious process. And that happens by first of all, understanding the impact of the brain damage, working out how these systems such as memory, language, et cetera, work, seeing what is still intact, and then trying to harness what is still intact to try to help people. And there is work happening in the dementias, for example, but it's, it's very early days, I'm afraid. Thank you for um, speaking to that as well, um, Dr. Jansari. Um, another question came in um, earlier, actually, and this is sort of more a um, practical one. Um, so students can sometimes struggle to put cognitive neuropsychology theory to practice. Yeah. So how can lecturers help students to do that more effectively? Um, I found that it's by contextualizing it is the best way. So, for example, I could give you a lecture about brain damage and amnesia and just go theory, 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 theory. But when I show you my video of Nicola, you get a real visceral sense of it. And I know that my students, three years after I've given them a lecture at graduation, after I've taught, taught them something in the first week of their de three year degree, three years later at graduation, they'll say, Oh, yeah, that video of Nicola, I can still remember it. 
Now, if their students can remember that, then that demonstrates that there's something quite visceral about our connection with other people who are suffering, as Nicola was, which then brings students closer to the field. Now, that's what happened with me. 35 years ago, I was struggling, trying to work out what I wanted to do in my second year in Cambridge. And someone suggested this thing called experimental psychology that I didn't know. And I went along to the lecture and one of the lectures was about brain damage. And I literally didn't know what it would be. And this woman, she talked about people who could tell you what happened 20 years ago, but not what happened 10, it, um, 10 minutes ago, which is the exact opposite of what you'd expect. You'd expect 10 minutes ago to be easier than 20 years ago. But she was telling us, no, there are people who can't remember what happened a few minutes ago, but can 20, min 20 years ago. She told us about people who couldn't recognize that little meowing creature that was in front of them. And I was amazed at this. And she had this real passion for sharing this knowledge of people who'd experienced these awful incidences, but who, who were an amazing window onto how we function ourselves. So I think that's the way I do it. I do it by personalizing it, showing them these videos of these, these patients that I work with, contextualizing it so that we're not talking about theories, memory theory, face recognition theory, et cetera, but letting those theories drop out of the person. Look at Nicola, what happened with her. Look at David, what happened with him. Look at Philip and what happened with him. And then using that as the building blocks for helping us see why it's so fascinating, but also important. So for me, I think that's the thing. And I think that, that it actually should be relatively easy to get students interested in cognitive neuropsychology because we're all going to, at some point, unless you've got a brain that isn't going to deteriorate at all, we're all going to experience some levels of difficulty. And I think have, getting an understanding of it is going to be really useful. Thank you very much. Um, that's fantastic. So I think that's actually all we have time for in terms of questions now. But I just want to say very quickly, and as we finish, thank you very much again for everybody who attended. Thank you so much to Dr. Jansari for providing us with that fascinating lecture and presentation. And, um, you know, if you asked a question and you didn't get, we just can get around to answering it, we will take it offline and answer later. But in the meantime, yep. we will, um, don't forget to visit our webpage and you can see a, a code on the screen there that will take you to our webpage on www.sagepod.co.uk and you can find out more about um, Dr. Jansari's new book, A Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuropsychology. Um, if you use the code UKPSYCH25, you can get a 25% discount, but um, uh, you could also, if you're a, a lecturer or a, an instructor of psychology, you can also request an inspection copy too. Um, we'll be sending an email after this session um, in the next few days, and it will have the webinar recording link, and you can watch it again or share it with your colleagues who may be interested. So once again, thank you to Dr. Ashok Jansari for his fascinating presentation. Thank you to my colleague Maria for helping to facilitate, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye.